Dear Heavenly Father, we come here to worship you. It's a beautiful Sunday, and we, we know that you're watching us. May your presence be with us as we study your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Today we're going to talk about uh, the one word that if you can do it, you'll be entering into this wonderful spiritual dimensions of Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 uh, is very much like uh, Psalm 20 Dirt, which is also wonderful. Uh, but Psalm 20 Dirt is more like in prosperity wise. But Psalm 30, uh, 91 is basically a dimensions of perfect peace and blessing. So it is a really tremendous dimension. I'm going to read to you quickly, and there are no cushion in this world that do not hope to be dwelling in the dimensions of Psalm 91. And of course, when we talk about the differences between charismatic theology and, and uh, mystical theology, mystical theology is more toward the true state of being and the dwelling, which is Psalm 91. And the charismatic theology is basically focusing on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations, the gifts, and all this stuff. So this is the, one of these ultimate dimension, almost ultimate. And I can say you cannot have too many other scriptures that can top this dimension for the mystical people because it's talking about dwelling. Okay? So, yeah, in Psalm 91, I will quickly read through it. When you read through it, you can see how wonderful it is. If you can do that, that is, you know, how you, what is the expression? God the gracious. Well, with that, no, no. It's like, like, oh my God thingy, right? Okay, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. That sounds pretty good, huh? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because in life, there's always trouble. Nobody can escape trouble. Right? Even young people will face their trouble. And to have God to be your fortress, Amen. that is awesome, right? Surely we will save you from the flower, uh, flower snare and from the deadly pedestal. Pedis 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 he will cover you with his feathers, and under his rings you will find refuge. It's so romantic. To hide under the wings of love, you know, like a song. Hmm. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terrors of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalk in the darkness, nor the plague that destroy at midday. Basically, he's talking about 24-7, daytime. You know, mid, uh, middays, nighttime, it's like you are perfectly safe because God is the one that protects you. And you will, uh, oh, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. So you will see many people fall. In life, you will see people rise, people fall, right? If you live long enough. And uh, there's always rise and fall, rise and fall. Uh, kingdom rise and fall. But what the Lord is saying is here, if you live in this Psalm 91 dimension, everybody, there could be a thousand fall right next to you, but you'll be standing. Imagine that you're going to war, right? Uh, and the enemy is just shooting everybody and bombing everybody, and you have a thousand, ten thousand around you. Everybody dropped dead, and you're the only one left standing. How you feel? You feel so blessed. You're the super lucky one because everybody was down, but you still left standing, unharmed. So, okay, you will, uh, verse 8, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. That means the, the, the powers of righteousness of God is upon you. 
Nobody can hurt you. Nobody can do something wrong to you without being punished. So your eyes will see it. It's not like you won't have a chance to see it, but you will literally have a chance to see all those who do wrong being punished by God. You can see this. This is a very, very powerful stuff.、Uh, you know, it's like a dream that we cannot even imagine that this can really happen to us. And then,、uh, okay. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will disaster disaster will come near your tent. So, if you can dwell in the Lord Most High, now that's the key words, dwell. So in mystical theology, we're not just talking about something that manifests. We're not talking about a vis and a visit and visitation of some sort, like God appears to you. We're talking about habitation. We are living in it. You know, it's like when you go to vacation, you see all kind of good stuff. You eat all the good food, and you see the beautiful lake and water, and you say, "Oh, it is so beautiful." But you know that it's not. It's going to end, and you're going to come back to your little old home. And, you know, and and live your life, right? So, but right here, in this Psalm ninety one, is a dimension that is not talking about you visit heaven. You're basically living in it, like you're dwelling in it. So this is a very very glorious scripture, and you know it takes one word. If you can do this one word, you'll be able to inherit the fullness. Of Psalm ninety-one, so are you guys interested in knowing what that word is? Okay, and is, I'm trying to be impractical. Okay, I'm not trying to,、uh, but to to explain this word, I need to use four places of scriptures to point toward it in different angles. Then you understand what this word really means. Okay, the first scripture, the first part of the four, is in Titus. Chapter two, and we know John.、Uh, we know Paul has two spiritual son, Titus, and Timothy. And when Paul talked to these two special kids, special spiritual sons, he he always talked to them about church, about what God's want from a church, what God's want from a demand from a Christian. So.、Uh, Is really like a theology for pastoral theology when it, for these two books, Titus and、uh, Timothy. But in Titus chapter two, verse one to eight, is a very special group of scripture because we say this is the only place in the entire Bible where you can call that eight scripture a curriculum. Why is that? It's because in this four verses, Titus chapter two, one to eight. It's talking about elder man. You should do this, 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 this. Woman, you should do this, 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 this. Young children, you should do this, this, this. It's like the only scripture that covers it all gender, all ages, like from Amanda to Martin, right? And from Nancy to yeah, to little <laughs> to little young boy. So it's like everybody's in it. <laughs> everybody's involved. Usually. The scripture is telling、uh, some spiritual people,、uh, or some not so spiritual people,、uh, some baby Christian,、uh, some serious Christian, you know. But this is the only place in the Bible, in these eight verses, you find Paul address it to Titus about old man, young man,、uh, young, you know, old woman, young woman. So it's a curriculum. It's very important for Christian, and <clears throat> basically. <coughs> Is telling the old man to have、uh, self-respect, self self-control, and telling the woman to have uh, this this uh, this self-control and things like this. And talking to the young man is about self-control and and all the things. Basically, if you sum it up, these eight verses, you come up with the idea about re restraining yourself from your own desire, earthly desire. That's basically that's what self-control means, because we understand that. Discipline, self-control, 
is one of the last fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? For now, right? Self-discipline. It's very important. And Paul said in this spiritual battle, spiritual journey, we are like people in the race and we are like people in a competition. Everything has discipline. What it's saying is, when you're not a Christian, you can do anything you want. Because not, there's no rule, right? As long as you don't get your mom upset, you, you're okay. But as a Christian, everything about your walk, your decision, is, about, is, is confined in, the wall, the, in this called, so-called law of God, or better yet, the will of God. You don't just do anything because you feel like it, right? When we're young, we, we were like that, right? Hey, let's go to Reno. You know, we, we go there, right there. We, we like that prompt uh, impulse thingy that, uh, that we used to do when we were a little kid. But actually, as we grow up, we understand that actually you don't do anything you want to do. You want to do everything that is abiding to his law and abiding to his word and you know, in his will because that is called discipline. And actually, discipline plays a big part into the word that we are about to discuss. Because discipline is one of the ultimate things that a Christian should do. Ultimate things. And all good things come through discipline. Right? All good body comes out with hard discipline. You look at somebody with you no know, good looking body, you think, oh, I wish I could be like that. And you could be like that if you have the discipline. And the discipline is to wake up early, you know, uh, and you don't want to sleep too late and you want to exercise, and you want to keep your diet, and it's just a lot of things comes into play. And, and you don't go to the gym, just, just hang out and talk like the Hong Kong gym people. You, you want to really go into the gym and hit the schedule, and you know, and all this, there's, there's a lot of discipline involved. And, and it is not something that it just happened overnight. Discipline is a, is a long-term thing to build that up. You know. So you could be a journalist and you could be very disciplined. You can be a, a, a why are you laughing? Oh, you can be anything. But if you want to be great in anything, you have to be disciplined. Then it's got to have some kind of discipline of some sort. You know, it's not just hard work, but discipline, right? So that is what uh, sums it up. Uh, Titus chapter two, verse one to eight. Discipline. Okay, now I want to focus on one word, and this word is the word that can get you to live and to dwell, you know, in a high place. Okay, and the word is in is the same thing in in, in Titus chapter two. Uh, in verse twenty, uh, uh, verse two, verse two is talking about. Teach the old man to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-control, okay? Uh, uh, worthy of respect. And then when it comes down to the, the, the kids, young men, that's the right word. Verse 7. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness. Now that is the word, seriousness. So basically, in Greek... Oh no, in Hebrews, in Greek, not in Greek. <laughs> this word is called semnotus. And semnotus, when it's translated into King James Bible, the new King James Bible say reverend. Reverence means to worship or to gaze with reverence. It's like something you, will, you know, you're always like focusing on it, right? And then in old King James, is called gravity. And not the physical gravity, gravity, but it's like you wait in on it. Your whole life waits in on that. Like if you are an artist, your whole life, your gravity of your life is upon art. If you're music, you know, you know just like your weight of your being, your weight of your effort is weighed in on it. Right? That's called gravity. In English Standard Bible, it's called dignity. Dignity is like the best of your being, right? Like Steph Curry, he, his dignity is basketball. If you take away basketball from him, he will be like an ordinary person, right? But if you let him be who he wants to be, he have great dignities on the court, right? 
And in NIV, it's called seriousness. Most of you have NIV Bible. That's why you said seriousness. The word seriousness means I am very, very concerned about this. I uplift this matter above all matters, right? And New American Bible say dignify means uplifting, exhorting this. So with all the other translation, aren't you kind of a little bit confused about these words from Greek called semotes? Uh, but semotes in the Greek word, why it comes out to be so many different uh, translations? If even in the Chinese Bible, the translation is even worse. Okay, it's really far from the original meaning. But basically, the ultimate meaning for it is called focus. And I can see some of the young people start knocking their head. Yeah, I know that word. And that makes it simple. Focus, yeah. If you talk about seriousness, gravity, dignifying, it's getting kind of weird. But then when you say focus, oh yeah, fo focus. I know what focus means, right? But it's not like ordinary focus. That's why it's so hard to translate for the Bible. Uh, it's been using among the athlete, 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 leaked. Yeah. Like the people in the archery. When a guy is going to shoot this archery bow, right? He's focusing. But this focus is not like focusing. His focus is through training, through great skill, through talent, and through years of you know, cultivating. So when he focus, it's not like you focus. So when Steph Curry is shooting his ball and it is his final moment and you know, they got a ball and he can shoot one shot and make the whole game seals it for championship. And when he jumps up to make that shot, he is totally simultaneous. He's like totally in a different world. Nothing matters to him. You know, he completely sung out everything because he is so focused on making that shot. And that's where this word comes from, is a, is a term for sport mainly using for sport. Or maybe when you play piano, you know how like, people get very complicated with the, with the pieces? And uh, you, sometimes you wonder, how can that guy focus on all these crazy nooks and so fast? It's like, but he's very focused. You know, and it's like, even though there is a lot of stuff going on, people, the crowd could be cheering, and, uh, but then this guy is so focused on his piece, right? And it's like Tiger Wood, uh, when he's trying to hit that shot, right? He will kneel down, he will check this and that, and everybody is cheering. Maybe people are quiet and people is hot and the sun is beating on him, so he's soaking wet. And uh, there's all kind of things. Maybe his mom is watching and his girlfriend is, 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 is not happy or whatever, right? There could be a lot of things happen. But when he is checking, trying to make that shot, he is totally zoned out. It's the ability to focus. That's what's... Summertess. It's an ability. It's not just focus, because your focus to shoot, make that shot, and Steph Curry focusing on making that shot is totally two different kind of focus, because his focus is a well-trained, it's an ability, it's his talent, it's his dignity. He, he, he put his entire gravity on that shot his whole life, right? Now you're getting close to the meaning of it. Okay. So you, know, you, can, you guys are pretty good with it. So the second part verses I want to bring it to it to your attention is Roman chapter 13, verse 14. It's a very fast one, so I, you're gonna have to flip the Bible. Rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Now this is a very unpleasant scripture for young people, because young people always have this, this urge right, to prepare for fun, prepare for something, right? But right here what he's saying is, clothe yourself with Christ, means Jesus Christ, he did not prepare himself for anything that distract him from doing the will of God. So when you clothe yourself with Jesus Christ, meaning that you're always conscious, always focusing on doing the will of God, and you don't prepare yourself for anything else, because those things could be a distraction. Um, for example, like, uh, you know, 
if I choose to study the theology, right, and I want to get a good uh, PhD degree, and then I will think about, okay, I am going to spend two years of hard work to get that degree. But when I spend two years of hard work to get a degree, I will jeopardize my family. I will neglect my cats a little bit more. I will, you know, you will lose something because you only have so much time. So when you plan on something, you should start thinking about what is the most important thing that you must accomplish. Now, if I have nothing else to do sitting around at home, then maybe I should say, yeah, let's go study, right? But if I have other things that is more important thing to do, right now at this very given moment, I want to set up the man-child church, I want to set up the second reformation funding, there's a lot of things coming in play in, the, in uh, next month or, no, or December latest. So it's a very busy period of my time, and uh, there's a lot of spiritual counselor and advisors telling me, don't do a chalice because you will be busy on something else. Forget about the degree, okay? That's not the most important thing, right? So, so when I'm making my decision, I'm using Romans chapter 13. Will, will this kind of planning obstruct my true purpose in Christ? Right? So you have to take that into account. Some people say, oh, wow, that job is good. It pays good. And then when you get that job, it's find out, oh, Sunday you cannot work. Every other Sunday you have to work. You cannot go to church. So that's a huge sacrifice, right? So basically planning, by planning, taking that job, if it's not absolutely necessary, you are basically falling into the trap of Romans chapter 13. Is you are planning something that jeopardizes you or mess up your schedule for something that is more important to you. Okay, so you got the second point. The first point is about all this definition, and the second point is about that, 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 that attitude of planning and decision. Okay, the third point is more clear now. It's Hebrew chapter 12, the first few verses, and it's talking about uh, how, Jesus, uh, how there are, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So the author of Hebrew is telling us that since we have this great mission, great calling from kingdom, and look at all these witnesses, they be, they've been showing us how great it is, how glorious it is. So we want to run this race, we want to complete this mission. We don't want to get entangled by sins and by little things that hinder us, you know. We want to take off all this baggage. It's like you're going on a race, you would not, uh, you know, put on your suit. Even though it looks pretty cool on you. Because all this thing is, is like, is, is hindering you from running fast, right? You take off your ties, you make, you make sure yourself is very, very comfortable, right? And you will not wear your high heel, you know. Even though it looks beautiful on you, you will make sure you everything is no hindering for you to run that race. And that's basically what it means there. And it's talking about Jesus Christ, using Jesus Christ as this example. Fix your, our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he en endured the cross, scoring his shame and sat down at the right hands of the throne of God. So when Jesus is going through the cross, is it painful? Super painful. So, but, but the Bible said the reason that he can endure all this thing and he won't let it distract him because he was focusing on what he can accomplish through the cross. And that is salvation. And who he is, what is his joy? We are his joy. The church is his joy. So by so determined to bring forth this salvation for the church and, the, and the, to love us, he neglect everything out, he looked down, everything is like, those are distraction, right? And then uh, the, the author of Hebrew continues to say in verse 3, Consider him who endures such opposition from sinner, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So Jesus Christ went through a lot of opposition to fulfill his mission, and he ignored everything that distract him, distract him. So you guys should do the same thing, and then... The author also add one more word. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You know, in a, a lot of third world country, you want to do God's will, you may have to bleed. You may have to die. 
right? I'm, I'm seriously. There's 60 countries in this world, they will really persecute you, right? In America, we are so spoiled. All our problem that we face, all our obstruction, is basically about your parents or maybe who, who somebody giving you trouble to do some uh, to come. It, it, I mean, our obstruction hasn't caused us to bleed, right? I was watching a movie yesterday. It's called Hunter Killers. It was so good. That was a beautiful movie, but it, it shows the cruelty of the of the of the war, right? And as I was watching it. There was this clear voice of God coming, clear voice of God in the theater. Oh, of course, God always like to talk to me in the theater. And uh, it would say, Charles, I do not need you to ever go through this physical war you know, you're with your wife because I want you to be focused on the spiritual war. So I know I'm, I'm born for a spiritual war. And in the spiritual warfare, we, we take hits, you know, we get hurt. But I was thinking, Gee, I'd rather fight a spiritual war than to fight those spiritual war when, when, when everything is like, you know, so cruel. There is nothing crueler than war. So young people, you know, uh, don't, don't make yourself some excuse of how hard your life is because if this is war time, then you will know what is called a tough life. In war time, life really sucks. In any war time, you know, imagine the Chinese war, China and Japanese war, you know, the Communist war, or, or, or the Napoleon war, or the, uh, you know, the, the Hitler war, you know, all wars are very, very cruel. Nobody have good meals, nobody has peaceful sleep, because war, the nature of war. So, this is what the, the author of Hebrew is saying that, no matter what you go through, no matter how hard it is, just think of it as Christ suffered great pain. He's still focused. So Jesus was saying, and was hanging on the cross, and the Bible said God doesn't want to see it. So God just turned his face for him for a moment, and Jesus was crying out, My Lord, my Lord, why are you forsaking me, right? And I was thinking that if you hang me on the cross with all those pain, I will not be able to pay attention to is he looking at me or not because I will be focusing on my pain. And literally a lot of people walking through that busy life, even God doesn't look at them, they could care less. Actually, they won't even notice. They won't notice because they don't know how to focus like Jesus focused. Jesus was very focused on his Father. So the moment, even though when he was suffering on the cross, when, the, when God just... just not look at him, he say, why are you not looking at me? You know? So Jesus went through this focus to a point that even pain did not distract him. Now, this is the third point that you can get it. So this focus is not like regular focus. It's not like you're focusing on your games, okay? Or focusing on your video. It's focusing with great intensity. The first uh, t uh, Titus chapter 2 is a focusing with, with well, cutting off all the things that distract you. Reframe yourself from all the desire that will, that will mess up your focus. And in Romans chapter uh, 13, right? Oh, 13, 14? Ch uh, chapter 13 is talking about how I'm not going to plan for anything that would distract what I'm trying to focus on. And Hebrew chapter 12 is about this ultimate focus like you will take on all kind of opposition, including bleeding, but you will not lose focus as Christ did not lose focus. So he finally completed and succeeds. Succeed, succeed, success, succeeded. Okay, okay. Now you're ready for the last. The last verses will summarize everything, and you will understand clearly what it, what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, by the way, uh, for those who are uh, uh, late. We're talking about how to use one word. If you can use and live out this one word, you'll be able to inherit this greatest treasury of Psalm 91, which is totally dwelling in uh, with God. Okay, so in Isaiah, is uh, basically a little miniature Bible, because Isaiah have 66 chapter, just like the Bible have 66 chapter. And the funny thing is, Isaiah have 39, the first 39 chapter. 
is like the New Testament. It's written like the New Testament. And the last 27 chapter is written like the New Testament. Oh, the, the first one is Old Testament and New Testament. So we know we have 39 uh, books of Old Testament and 27 New Testament. So little, basically it's like a book within a book. I say it's the only book that has 66 and 39 and 27. And everything is just right, right? There's only a little Bible inside your book. So in Isaiah chapter 33, it's going to give us the answer. You know, I'm trying to preach, and I will try to preach this way, uh, to give you guys, to make people a little bit more curious. So I'm not going to give you everything. I'm just going to give you a little bit so you will be drawn to it. I hope, I hope you can be drawn to it. Because it's the way Jesus was preaching. Because Jesus, uh, he preached like a rabbi. Yeah. He did not preach like an evangelical person or a pastor because there's no such thing at that time. He preached like a rabbi. And rabbi is using a method called remez. R-E-M-E-Z. Remez is a method that I'm just going to give you a little bit and then let you figure it out. So because you work hard at a question, uh, question by the time you get the, uh, mm, mm, by the time you get that answer, you, you will have a greater impact to your life. Because instead of I'm telling you this and you just forget it. But I, I'm telling you, I always give you, so what is the key to do that, right? What's the, and it's, it's basically, like Jesus like that too. He like to give you a little bit and ask you, right? What do you think if something happened, right? So uh, it is a way of, uh, remass is how, how the rabbi is, <laughs> is teaching. So right here, there's one word that we're seeking, right? And in Isaiah chapter 33, it really like totally describes this word perfectly. But you have to understand something. It's a safe verse 14. The sinner in science are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Why he say that? Because Isaiah understand the holiness of God. He was not holy. And then the angels was using a hot coal and torches mouth, right, lips, and then he becomes holy. So he understands the holiness of God. And he understands that if you want to dwell in the presence of God, you will be sanctified, you will be purified, you will be, you know, you, you, you will be broken. And, and, you know, God will do a lot of things to you so, to, so that you will not be unholy. Okay, so he, he raised this question, verse... Uh, 15, okay. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? So this God is a consuming fire. As book of Hebrew was described. So if you want to dwell in this, you know, dwell with the holies of holy, that God, you're basically dwelling with the consuming fire. So Isaiah is telling us it's not that simple. Who dare to, to live with this consuming fire day in, day out, right? So he listed out in verse 15 a very simple way of righteousness. And with this righteousness, it should enable us to live with him. And it goes like this. Uh, those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes, who stop their ears against pots of murder and shut their eyes against compilating evils. Uh, basically, I want to sum it up, is do not take, do not take a uh, benefit when somebody has to lose something. Like sometimes when you try to make deal, do not try to cut that deal so, so mean, right? And you feel so good about it. And sometimes you, you go there and say, oh, this thing doesn't worth that much money. And, and at the end you got it and you tell people bragging about, see, I got this with this little money because it was so much, you know? And actually there was another guy that is selling you that basically suffers some kind of thing. So basically it's like a godly life it's not a life that trying to fight for gain. And a godly life is not a life, it's not a life that 
like violence. Because the Bible said the devil come to steal, to destroy, and to kill. That's devil stuff. And God doesn't like devil stuff. So I was talking about to the other group, like the, the, the best example is your video game, right? So all the kids is playing like three hours, four hours, video game sometimes, two hours. And that video game is mostly about violence, like killing aliens, killing this, killing that, killing enemies. You know, shooting. So imagine your mind is being conditioned by two, three hours of violence every day, right? Basically, it's totally demonic, okay? And therefore, the, the young people, is so hard to get into the mystical dimension because their mind is, is conditioned by this culture of demonic culture, right? So I'm not saying that don't play video games. It will be so cruel for your parents to not let you play. It's almost like killing you, okay? Because this violence has zipped into your blood. You, you're going to kill yourself if you have no more video games. So basically, the point is, we are living in this, in this society, but you have to understand a lot of things that gets into you are not in godly. Uh, it's not in a godly spirit, okay? Now, if you can avoid all these things, then you can live out Psalm 91. It says that. Verse 16. It says that... Hmm... What is it? They are the ones, okay, who will dwell on the heights or dwell on high ground. Those refuges will be mountain fortress. That is exactly like Psalm 91, being protected by God completely. Their bread will be supplied and water will not fail them. That's talking about the drawing, the desire, right, the need. So let me make a statement here. I'm not sure it's absolutely a statement, but this is a statement. It goes like this. You cannot forever love something if your heart is not drawn toward that. Because your heart desire is what enables you to constantly focus on something. Like if I love, love Corey, right? So when I go out with Corey, I, I will focus on Corey. I would tell everything that happens during that time when I'm with, supposed to be with her, that don't bother me. I, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm cutting up the, So I'm very focused to pay full attention to her, right? Because I love her, right? Now, if I don't love her, then I, I have to focus on Corey. I, I have to help her when she needs me. I have to be there when she, and I'm just forcing myself to do it, but actually I don't have that real love. It will not last. Same thing for basketball. Same thing from art, same thing from music. You cannot really be so focused on something if your heart is not drawn to it that, right? Is that a right statement? So you can see that dwelling in the, in the realms within God takes a hunger, a thirst, like my heart pathed, pathed for you as deer path, pathed for water. So you have to have a drawing. And that's mystical. It sounds mystical now. You have a drawing. So I want to be dwelling in the temple of the Lord and behold your beauty for the rest of my life. And for, that, for a lot of people, that will be so boring, right? Because your heart is not drawn to it. Who wants to stay in the church and behold the beauty of God for the rest of my life? I want to go outside and play. I want to go to this land, right? So, but you can see it's the draw of the heart. And the more your heart is being drawn, the more you're focusing, and the more you're focusing, the more you're into the dimension, and the more you're in the dimension, one thing will happen. I have three minutes, I want to wrap this thing up. Stay with me in this, the last word. S verse 17, your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. So you're no longer spiritually nearsighted. You have a spiritual eyesight to see what is good. Because the world have taught us so many things that is good, but actually is not good. He trained us to be powerful, to, to be able to take over people, take over conquer land, but then that is really not good, okay? So you look at a beautiful, provocative woman and you think, wow, that is good. But actually that is really not good. I mean, in the spiritual sense. The spiritual sense is what is good is the beauties of the king, the beauties of his spiritual dimension, 
the beauties of the Lord of Most High that you dwell in Him, the beauties of the temples of the Lord, and it's the beauty that draws you so that you can actually focus. But when you focus and you dwell, your eyesight will be open. It's like, it's like a gracious, a glorious circle. So, and this is the point that I want to talk about, Corey, because I, it, it, there was a few person that I loved dearly in my life, but I don't love them because of whatever reason, like normal reason, but I was being so drawn by the spiritual beauty. Like Corey is a, in the oracle, and every, thing, every time I saw her, and I saw Priscilla with this spiritual spirituality, uh, I would have this butterfly, like falling in love, literally. It's like totally like, whoa, it's like hot melting. Literally like this, I can't even, ex ex I can't even explain. It is almost like, yeah, hot melting is the word. And why my heart melts is because I, I, I recognize and acknowledge the beauties of that. So some of, you, some of your guys didn't see her so attractive is because you're not as spiritual as me. If you're more spiritual as me, you will start doing that. Because there is a purity inside her because God kept her as an oracle. That is something so precious that in this whole world, right now, you cannot even raise up five finger. You know, and she was one of those five with that kind of purity. And that's why the the trance state is automatic. And when she seeks for, you know, vision, it's like so simple and so direct, right? So there's a lot of beautiful things. Actually, I don't have time to talk about your beauties. That, all of you have some kind of beauties, right? And, uh, um, and why I see this beauty? Because I am a person dwelling in Psalm 91. I'm not preaching a sermon that I, I, I can reach myself and I hope you guys can, hey, let's go on a journey. I, I, I'm already living in there. And in the kingdom, in, his, in, the, in the covering of the Most High, I see everything. I see the beauties of the king differently. And people want to look at big church. I don't care about big church because big church may not be beautiful. But the spirit of this church is very beautiful. And sometimes you get it together with a few friends, but the spirit of it is priceless. You know, and there are tons of beautiful uh, 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 babies, right? We have a lot of beautiful babies. But look at Amanda. Amanda has a certain beauty that no other baby has. And, and also every baby has a little different thing. But do you have that spiritual insight? Or is your eyes is still blind by the fruit and evils where the devil is telling Eve, hey, if you predict this, if you eat this, protect this, and then your eyes will be open. And actually, her eyes did not get open. Basically, her eyesight is even worse. Get worse. She got worse. But if you dwell in the presence of God long enough, you will have spiritual insight, and you will start to think, to see what is so beautiful in life. And all this comes together in the focus, in the discipline, and it's a lifestyle that you're not just visiting Him but you are dwelling in him is a, is a habitation of glory and beauty. So, um, yeah, in summary, I would have to say, it is a pretty tough sermon, but I guess you guys can get it, huh? Try to learn to focus. And uh, actually, next week I can continue, continue on, is to a little bit more practical, how to focus how to get yourself started to focus on Christ. And it's not about just sitting there and being stiff about it and constantly thinking about Jesus, Jesus, and, and holding a cross and keep thinking about it. It's not that kind of focus, okay? It's about how to be drawn by His beauty and then gaze upon His beauty and worshiping and looking upon Him. And when you do that long enough, your body is, is like you suck into it. You are in His presence, the presence of the Most High. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for giving us today. And although it's a simple word of Samotus, and today we learn a little bit about these words and different definition of it, but Lord, most importantly, may we be able to practice it and walk in it and 
and draw on ourselves and position ourselves in Psalm 91 so we can reap all the, the rich heritage in the Bibles. Lord, please help us all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.